for tourism and the um, inshore coastal zone uh, becomes uh, affected by chemical runoff from golf courses. There's mining, which as you know, is now going from bauxite alumina into more extensive uh, mining of limestone. Very intensive use of our coastal zone for both habitation and um, commercial activity. And of course, uh, a socially uh, and economically unequal society. And historically, investment in behavior tends to be short term, low risk, high return. And government's policy, policy has been to try to mitigate risks, to keep the, the risks low. And in some cases, even to guarantee a floor on the return of uh, foreign investments. The policy context is quite rich. Just some highlights here, Vision 2030, which is the overall view that we have to locate all new policies in. The government's commitment to greening, both internationally and nationally, is particularly relevant to what we are doing here with the green economy investment strategy. Climate change policy, of course, and even more relevant, even more immediate is the national investment policy, which is in its final stages. And of course, all relevant sectoral policies. And as Gillian pointed out, we have been particularly focused on, on five of them. The immediate context, of course, is that we are in as part of the activity of the plastic waste minimization project. And we are starting the recovery from the COVID induced economic dislocation, which has affected countries all over the world. And in another context, I've argued strongly that this is an opportunity to reset just about everything in Jamaican economy and society. And in the case of the green economy investment strategy, it may well be an opportune time for its implementation within and aligned to the recovery strategy that has been articulated by the government. Our method basically has been the usual primary research in which we spoke to leaders of both the public and private sector uh, to get a, a sense of what leaders have thought in things economic um, feel about uh, green investments. It turns out that in almost every case, there's a bias towards energy, reducing the um, fossil fuel use as their perception of greenness. And one of the things we're suggesting is to, to be able to broaden that notion of greening yeah, with the green in economy investment strategy. Secondary research involved really checking literature from all over the world. OECD has done a lot of work, but basically their work has been focused on corporate activities and the way in which the, both the ethics and the placements of um, corporate investments uh, are being considered in the light of environmental issues, hence greening. And we also looked at the experiences of selected countries around the world uh, that have committed themselves to greening to see whether or not they have developed a green economy investment strategy. I didn't find any. I didn't find any, and in that sense, what we are doing then would be path breaking. So one of my first requests is if anybody knows about one, they need for another country. It's very important that they share it with us so that we can make sure we are covering all the bases. Now, the green economy is a state. It's something that we are moving towards. So I, I prefer to think of the process of greening and that process of greening really in the case of Jamaica has been interpreted to have four themes. Reducing the carbon footprint of the economy and in that sense we are contributing to the, the mitigation of greenhouse gases, however marginal that contribution is. Improvement of the management of natural resources and that is where our commitment to sustainability has come in, where, the, where we have to be conscious of the efficiency of use and the sustainability of use of our natural resources. 
In the case of Jamaica, as many small island economies, adaptation to climate change is far more important than mitigation of climate change. And I think we have a common sense that the change in climate has been impacting us in many ways, the most dramatic ones being the intensification of natural hazards when they hit us. And to promote greater economic inclusiveness. This is an area in which we depart from the developed countries notion of greening, where for us, um, the Jamaican government has in several places suggested that greening the economy must mean reducing the economic inequalities that exist. And for the record, I, when I'm speaking here about the green economy, I'm embracing marine development. Now I know nowadays that's been taught about, spoken about as blue economy. But the truth is that we have to begin to think of a place like Jamaica as an archipelago with the main island on which we live and several outcroppings and rocks, various estimates, 65, 69 of them. And if we begin to think of Jamaica like that, then we will shift our attention from only terrestrial development to include marine development because the marine environment would exist in between the various um, islands and outcroppings and rocks that constitute Jamaica. So what do we mean by green investment? Well, it's capital expenditure on projects that drive the same economic processes that we refer to that support or stimulate the greening of the economy in the sense of at least one of the following which we have uh, discussed before. Namely, fostering a low carbon resilient economy, efficient use of natural resources, adaptation to climate change and economic inclusiveness. So where we see capital expenditure that's facilitating processes that move towards any of these, any one or all of these we would regard now, that does not exclude or preclude within any given investment project other expenditure on activities um, to use the same in, in projects, in the same project. So, what we are saying is that the, the, the investment expenditure, we're looking at the share that goes towards promoting um, greening, but in any given investment project, there may be expenditure on things which are not supportive of greening. Um, most common example being fossil fuel energy use. So for example, if we think of greening in the sense of inclusiveness, where we have small farmers networked to a large commercial farm, or for example, for water distribution. In both of these cases, fossil fuel energy at the present time would be critical. But we would have to look at the relative share of expenditure on the inclusive side as opposed to the use of um, fossil fuel. Another example is the use if the development of nature tours using four wheel all-terrain vehicles. Now, with that in mind, we have the difficult challenge of identifying what is a green investment project. And the simplest way, I think, is that if we, when we look at ex total capital expenditure for the project, if, this, if more than 50% of the expenditure supports green activities, then we can regard that as a green investment project. This is an area that has caused a lot of reflection uh, up to this point. And so we are inviting um, criticisms and evaluations and suggests again, to see if we can make this actually clearer so that it becomes uh, operational. So what is this green economy investment strategy that we are proposing? First of all, we start out with the limited time frame 2020 to 2030 in respect of vision 2030. Obviously strategy like this has to be extended and it probably is appropriate for it to be extended within the higher horizon that um, Vision 2030, 2030 eventually will. And the goal essentially is to shift the investment process over time to support the greening of the economy. What are those objectives? Well, the first one is really the integration of environmental considerations into all investment dec decisions. That's the, the broad theme. But then 
the other four objectives we have seen already, which is reduction in Jamaica's carbon footprint, economic sustainability and climate change resilience, that's the sustainable use of natural resources, adaptation to climate change and promotion of economic inclusiveness, which we have identified before as greening. So the objectives of the green economy investment strategy has to be uh, to support greening as we have defined it. We've identified 11 strategic directions. These are aggregates. One could break them up into smaller groups and maybe there are, there are others that we want to consider. But sure, certainly it would have to depend upon um, macroeconomic and social stability. Uh, I think the social stability part is extremely important for the green economy investment strategy since inclusiveness is a part of its objectives. Uh, but that of course is a, a well-established goal in Jamaica uh, for investment in general and for other reasons too. Associated with that is the attempts to reform uh, the business, the, 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 to make it easier to do business in Jamaica by reforming the bureaucracy and the various processes that uh, companies have to engage with in, in doing business in Jamaica. Important that we raise the priority level of greening in all aspects of public policy, whether it is recurrent expenditure, public education, capital expenditure, but that has to be a theme that runs through. And already we have been committed essentially to sustainable development um, in all aspects of public policy. So greening should not um, pose any challenges here. Uh, we must coordinate policymaking and implementation. That's a problem for every form of capital investment in Jamaica already, but to move into a new area is going to require even greater coordination to make implementation efficient and effective. So promoting greening has to be one of the um, objectives of public policy, not, a, not simply a matter of raising the priority of, uh, of greening in all aspects of public policy, but actively promoting greening. Uh, and of course, to shift the investment behavior, one has to find a way for the incentive regime as it is to be shifted, the balance of it to be shifted towards um, green investments. Uh, we have not proposed any new incentives, although that is something that the government may wish, may wish to consider. What we are suggesting is that there is an incentive regime. Now, the question is, how do we shift the balance towards um, green investments? Then, the public sector has to set its own example by incorporating greening in public investment so that public investment to be approved should have as a criteria on how it serves one of the objectives of greening. Fostering green financing schemes, all the countries that we looked at, even though they didn't have an official green investment, green economy investment strategy, address the issue of raising financing for various green projects, whatever it happened to be. In some cases, like Indonesia, it was interconnecting the various islands in the archipelago. In Rwanda, it was improving the city so that it could be uh, friendly for people, for pedestrians as opposed to motor vehicles and so on. Transforming the energy sector, we have long been committed to that, though perhaps too late, we should have been committed earlier and we need to be a little bit more aggressive. There has been interesting um, investments in recent years. So I think we are well on the way and the green economy investment strategy would only reinforce the national energy policy. Developing relevant social programs, all the more important for social stability, which is so related to macroeconomic stability, which is so related to the investment climate. And here relevant social programs would cover the gamut. I don't mean only welfare programs, but it means skill training, for example, for workers to work in new kinds of industries, um, educating people towards uh, the, their behavior towards the environment, you know, and health issues and a broad range of, of social programs that will facilitate social stability. And finally, Greening. One of the areas that is important uh, varieties of plants and animals that can take warmer and drier temperature uh, climate. 
uh, and I use the example that as early as the 1940s, T.P. Lecky developed a breed of cattle for Jamaican conditions. And therefore, you know, what is it? 80 years later, surely we should be able to spend a little more of our research energies developing varieties of plants and animals and housing designs, etc., that suit the changing um, climate that we have. Okay, so that broadly outlines the green economy investment strategy. And we have begun a, a, to, to develop an action plan that's structured around the, the five objectives that I mentioned above, which we could refer to as outcomes. Each outcome having itself several outputs that would support it. And each output associated with actions within the respective time frames as immediate, short run, medium run, long run. And there was responsibilities for the actions would be shared among many um, MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies of government, which speaks to the issue of coordination. One thing we have not done is to estimate what the costs are. I think it's pretty too early to do that now. And that has to take place within the context of the financial uh, planning of the country. A major question that has haunted this work is, should there be a central specialized coordinating body to drive the green economy investment strategy? And if so, where should it be? This is the issue of coordination that has dogged the government of Jamaica from even before independence, where whenever you want to get anything done, you, you try to put it in the office of the prime minister to give it some kind of a political clout. Well, the question is, where would you, where would you put the coordinating body for all of the initiatives that's involved in so many MDAs, so many ministries, departments, and agencies in implementing a green economy investment strategy? So the central challenge really is public policy must shift investor behavior from short run towards long run to make them have an appetite for greater risk than traditionally they have had. And to be able to accept lower private returns, but those lower private returns will come with higher social returns, uh, uh, which is to the benefit of both the individual investor and to the society. So the green economy investment strategy proposes to do, do those things, to shift this investment behavior from short to long run, greater risk, lower private returns, by way of public education, more targeted investment and investment related policies, uh, setting the example with public investments in the public sector investment program should support the greening of the economy and shifting the incentive regime in favor of, of green investments. That's a big challenge. And at the present time, we are in inviting as many comments and suggestions as to how to flesh out this framework of ideas. And in particular, to speak to operationalizing it especially in the, uh, the investment decision making of our private sector, particularly locally, but internationally as well. Okay, so thank you. So now, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Witter, for, for your presentation. And um, we're gonna have a session for questions and answers to Dr. Witter on the draft. Um, Green Economy Investment Strategy. Um, just to say that the document was sent to all the invited participants, but if you have not yet received the draft document that Dr. Witter just presented, please let us know. Um, you can contact Ms. Kashta Graham, who would have sent you the invitation, and she will send across to you the, um, the draft document. Before we go into the question and answer segment, however, uh, there are some host rules. Go the question and answer session. So let, me, let us ask uh, Kashta to just push up, put up these host rules and then we can get into um, the, the question and answer session. So Kashta, please.
Okay, so um, so we are going to only um, take questions during the questions and answers session. So we ask um, colleagues not to really use the chat for um, other things than the questions and answers because we don't want to get confused when we are posing our questions, whether to Dr. Witter or when we have um, the, um, the panel discussion. Um, and then we also ask that you keep your microphones muted. And then we ask that in, in participating in the question and answer section, please raise your hand in a raise, with the raise hand feature. And then, and, or you are to type your question in the chat if you are unable to um, speak because of um, problems with the microphone. And of course, we ask that you do not post any inappropriate content and any inappropriate behavior uh, will not be tolerated in this session and we re reserve the right to eject you from the meeting. So with that said, uh, we're still hoping to have a very robust discussion with, with you on the green economy investment strategy and issues related to the green economy during this workshop. And we thank you again for your participation. So now we open the floor for questions and answers um, um, section for um, to Dr. Witter on the document that he just presented to you, the draft green economy investment strategy. Again, please raise your hand and we will give you the floor. So now the floor is now open. I'll ask Kasha to help me to navigate um, where there are raised hands. And also we asked um, that you, you um, put your name in the chat. We are not admitting anybody via their phone. So we will not be admitting anybody via their phone. Now we see persons named by their phone in the meeting. So please, we ask that everybody put their name. So it's, it's also important for the records of this um, workshop. Thank you very much. Any questions to Dr. Whittle? on the green economy investment strategy, which was just presented. Um, okay, I see no questions yet to Dr. Whittle. Um, probably when, as we go along, um, questions may arise. Um, that we could post to Dr. Witter even during the, after our panel discussion and we go, go into the question and answer segment there. So again, we thank Dr. Witter for the presentation of the draft green economy investment strategy. Okay, so um, we now have Minister Charles's address. So I will now ask, okay, so sorry, we are now getting a question from Christine Maret. Um, could the current discussion on bauxite mining be used as a basis for testing the strategy? Dr. Whittle? Yes. Um, I alluded to mining more broadly than the bauxite industry, but there's also mining of what they call marl, limestone, to make marl. And um, I think it's something that we have to think through, how, how, how consistent mining is with the greening of the economy. Uh, it was something that was recognized from the very beginning when the licenses of the mining companies required them to reinstate the land in usable condition when they were finished. Uh, we know that that has not been happened really and that there have been, you know, formal attempts to do that, but substantially nothing has happened. And to me, that is implicitly a notion that mining is destroying the natural environment. And, um, and therefore, in that sense, I could not regard it as sustainable. In the case of the mining of both the cockpit country for bauxite and the, the dry harbor mountain in St. Anne, the environmentalists have been keen to point out how important they are in and of themselves, but also for the purpose that they serve for the environment as a whole. And this, since these things are so very difficult, almost impossible to value really, you wonder whether or not the short-term gains that comes to us limiting group of persons from mining 
can possibly match the damage that is done to the environment from that. So my own personal view is that mining is inconsistent with that kind, with kind of greening and the sustainable development of the economy. And that, um, yeah, the, we should pay close attention to attempts to uh, extend mining, especially into sensitive environmental areas. Okay, good. Thank you, Dr. Whittle. And I see uh, Mrs. Karen McDonald Gale um, has raised her hand. So, Mrs. McDonald Gale, please go ahead and pose your question. And then we will um, go to um, Canary next. So, Mrs. McDonald Gale, please. Thank you. Morning to everybody and morning to Dr. Whittle. Um, I had um, one comment on, on the idea the, of the green economy investment and ensuring that, as I heard Dr. Witter mention, things like blue economy and circular economy concepts are well included, in particular in, in the island setting. Circular economy, indeed, um, it would be good to see more discussion. And I see Canary posting a note about um, the, the, the brown economy as part of that discussion. So. I'd love to hear more about what was thought along those lines. And in a similar vein, I was very, let's use the word, interested with the comment that said that the, the concept of the green economy, the, the green economy investment would not preclude continuing um, efforts that are non-green economy or um, that are not um, meeting those standards. I'm, I'm surprised by that kind of thinking and wondered how, how we will in the future make that link if we are not doing it now with, with this type of, of investment and process. Thank so you. you to, should I respond now? Yes, please, Dr. Witter, please go ahead. Hi, Ms. Karen, how are you doing? Uh, first of all, let me say, I am not comfortable with this, with this distinction that is made between blue economy and green economy. I'm not, I'm not comfortable. I, I've gone from sustainable development to green economy, and I'm resisting going any further to this separation known as blue economy. It has important political con um, connotations for us globally, where certain large powers are splitting the small islands from each other according to what they call large ocean economies at, as opposed to small island economies. So I think we should be very careful with the nomenclature. But let's get behind the slogans and deal with the issue of what is the substantive thought. If the substantive thought is that the marine environment needs to be protected and that the marine environment is a source of natural resources for sustainable development, I totally agree. And I'm suggesting that Historically, our bias towards terrestrial um, development has come because we don't conceive of the space to be developed beyond the main island on which we live. And I'm suggesting that if we deal with it, deal with Jamaica as an archipelago, as a place like Indonesia or Japan deals with themselves as archipelagos, then we will see this the marine environment, which is enclosed within those islands, as also immediately important from the point of view of development. And then you extend beyond that towards the economic zone. So I am totally for that. Uh, with regard to circular economy, uh, again, this is one of those areas that I often wonder how we strayed away from it. You know, when, when I first heard the term sustainable development, it struck me as to what, how could a development not be sustainable? What, what kind of development would there be that was not sustainable? And similarly, the notion of circular economy um, is really a commonsensical approach, which is to say that what we produce today is the input for tomorrow. And that way we, internalize what we call waste and therefore issues of treating the environment and so on becomes internalized to the production processes. So yes, I 
strongly include that view of the economy when I'm speaking about any economy in general. And certainly it is included in the notion that I put forward here for green economy investment strategy. There may be a case though for making it explicit as you are suggesting. Uh, with regard to the last issue, I am not saying that green economy in green, green investment um, includes in, so expenditures for browning a project. I am merely saying that in, in terms of defining what you mean by green investment, we need to see it on a continuum, namely that an investment project may have within it expenditure for greening and expenditure for not greening. We have a choice. Do we say that that project, because it has some expenditure for not greening, for browning if you prefer, should be excluded completely? My position is no. However, we need to get a clear idea what we mean by a green investment project. The project becomes green on that definition where the majority of the capital expenditure is for to support green activities. So it's um, not a matter of condoning the old ways of doing things. It is recognizing that the old ways of doing things are going to be with us for a while. And therefore we should not exclude um, partial attempts to address greening in the context of um, the old investment strategy. So it's, it's a matter of, of recognizing that night and day are in a continuum. There isn't just night alone and day alone. That's basically what the thinking is. It is not in any way condoning uh, or justifying um, investments that are not supportive of greening as we have defined it here. But thanks for the point, we need to make that clear. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Dr. Witto. And thanks to Mrs. D uh, McDonald Gale for that question. And we'll have a couple of questions in the chat, um, Dr. Witto. Um, so a question from Canary asking um, if we could discuss further if and how moving to incentivizing green business means reducing incentives for, for brown business. So how is it that we move it, moving to incentivizing green business means reducing incentives for brown business? Well, I think ultimately that is what I intend by suggesting um, shifting the balance. What it does say though, is that those beneficiaries of in those investments in the old brown economy that are already benefiting from investments, from incentives, should be encouraged to shift their activities towards greening. And so it is not a matter of getting up one day and telling the tourist economy that they can't get any more investments, but saying to those who are already benefited from, in, from incentives, well, to keep these incentives, uh, we need to see more action towards greening. So I think that ultimately incentives is a finite quantity, no matter how large we, we establish it at. And therefore, ultimately, I am suggesting a shift in the balance away from the old investment projects into the new ones. Yes. All right, thanks, Dr. Witter. So Dr. Smith is asking um, if you are aware of any holistic cost benefit analysis being done for mining bauxite or limestone or marble. Are you aware of any such um, study being cost benefit analysis being done? No, I am not. I didn't do know that some years ago we at the university were trying to value the cockpit country and we didn't get very far because of the cost of doing it. And there is an important methodological problems with, with, with the way in which we value uh, natural resources uh, because it depends a lot on what people think, how people feel about the natural um, resources and if people don't have much regard for it, then they will value it cheaply. I always remember that bauxite was sold in Jamaica for 10 cents a ton. 
uh, precisely because you know it was just red dirt that wasn't good for anything as far as we were concerned. So there is an, inher an inherent problem with putting monetary costs on natural resources. I don't know of any that is being done now. I would be very concerned that any such valuation um, be very careful that it does not end up undervaluing the natural resources. Thank you, Dr. Whittle. And just to say that this issue of, of um, natural resource accounting, um, environmental accounting is a big issue within the government. It's something that we have been grappling with for a long time. And, and yes, Dr. Witter is correct that there was a, an attempt to do um, that accounting for the Coptic country. And I think Dr. Witter that that exercise still needs to get done because it needs to inform our decision-making within the government. Um, there's a question from Tajri Welsh asking um, what indicators will be used to evaluate how foreign direct investment is related to carbon footprint and how um, FDI is contributing to low carbon energy transition. Could you repeat the question for me? It was just... So he's asking what indicators will be used to evaluate how foreign direct investment is related to carbon footprint and how foreign direct investment is contributing to low carbon energy transition. Hmm. Well, well, in the framework that we are proposing here, one would look at the, what the expenditure is made on. So for example, if the expenditure is made on a wind farm, uh, that expenditure would probably involve using some fossil fuel energy, at least in the establishment of the wind farm. We would want to think that of, a, of that as a green investment if the value of the wind farm itself is greater than the value of the fossil fuel energy needed to establish it. So like all investments, it seems to me that we would have to look at what the expenditure is spent on. Now, there are some foreign direct investment like the bauxite companies, for example, that are notoriously, uh, in my view at any rate, um, supporting damage to the environment. I might point out that the bauxite industry was always aware of this. And if you look at the, what, what they call them, the, let's say the articles of um, incorporation of these international companies, if you look at them, they are environmental commitments that they have made to environmental practices, which do not always translate into what they do in the underdeveloped countries in which they operate. So I know, for example, that if you look at Alcan's um, documents for incorporation, there are some very clear commitments to protecting the environment. But we couldn't see that in what they were doing here on the ground, except for cosmetic things like um, uh, pastures for animals and so on like that. So the interesting thing about the international companies is that they're increasingly being subject to uh, um, market forces that require them to make commitments to protecting the environment, much more so than our local investors at this point in time. So it's a very interesting question you raise, but we might find that some of the foreign investment is moving faster in the direction of greening than our local investment. Thank you, Doc. Another question from Canary. Boy, we have a couple of questions. So what I will do is um, I will try to group some questions, but let us go quickly to Canary because they are making reference to the actual draft document in front of us. And Canary is asking Dr. Witter for you to explain the term efficient management of natural resources, which um, he explains as 
in, in quotation marks, use as, a little as, as little as necessary, and that's on page 22 of the document, versus the, the use of the term sustainable use of natural resources. So he's asking, Canary's asking for you to, deter, to explain your use of the term efficient management of natural resources, as opposed to the use of the term sustainable use of natural resources, which has traditionally been used. And what are the differences and nuances here? And I just, think I have the same um, sense as which the question is raising it, you know, um, to use the natural resources that you have to use that's the efficiency part of it, and to use it sustainably, which mm -hmm. is to use it in such a way that you do not deplete it, destroy it, but have as much of it as possible, replenished, refurbished for the next generation. And that is where the circularity is coming in, in the case of the natural resources. Mm -hmm. um, just to say for our, thanks Dr. Witter, just to say for our colleagues that <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Peter Edwards has indicated that he did a valuation study for copy country on behalf of the Windsor Research Center in 2011 and Dr. Edwards, yes, and in fact, we the government has used um, that study uh, when we were making the case on the copy country and Ingrid Parchment has also indicated she's from CCAM that there's a natural resource valuation study of the Portland by protected area. So there are some valuation studies around. Um, and we know for a fact that we have used Dr. Edwards's um, study already. Um, yeah, we're, we're aware of both of them. In fact, Edwards's study was used for as a proxy for valuing the pollution of the Kingston Harbor. And mm -hmm. that is the problem that we, we have, which is it asks people what would they be willing to pay for this or for, you know, to protect resources or to use resources. And, and um, we found that um, it, it, it seemed to us to come out lower, but it was certainly a, a, a wonderful pioneering attempt to get a hold as to what the communities around the cockpit country, how they value the, the resources. Yes, that was a very important contribution. Thanks also, Witter. Keisha Ann Thompson is asking, she did, you did mention on a slide, Dr. Witter, in your presentation, this 50% suggested rule and um, obviously she said she didn't catch it, uh, all of it, but she's asking um, for an example of how this rule could work and in relation to a project um, hypothetically or real. So she's asking about how this rule, this particular rule that you had put forward in your um, presentation, how would it work? Again, the problem is identifying, is identifying operationally what you mean by a green investment. So for example, if you say you're going to give um, incentives to green investment, what would the investor have to show that, um, that would make it qualify for incentives for green investments? And that is why I have, I have chosen to look at it as a, a continuum to speak of green investment as the expenditure the particular expenditure that supports the, um, the four objectives of greening. Now in any given project, we're going to have that intends to do some um, green investments, there is likely to be some activities that are supportive of that investment but which for example, using fossil fuels would be a common case where you would have um, some expenditure on non-green activities, such as burning fossil fuel. Now, if you look at it that way, then in any given investment project, a certain percentage of it could be green. And I am saying, at what point does the investment become a green investment project? At what point do you, do you declare it a, 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 a green investment project? Do you wait till all 100% of the expenditure is supporting the green objectives? Or do you choose some smaller percentage? And if you choose a smaller percentage, it seems to me that that smaller percentage has to be 50%. Now that is purely arbitrary. When it comes down to granting the incentives, the government of Jamaica might say, well, no, we, we're not granted, we don't regard it as a green investment project, 
uh, although uh, unless the percentage of the expenditure is say 75%, well, that is an administrative uh, concept. And at this point, we are only trying to suggest that we shouldn't take an all or nothing approach. We should recognize that a percentage of any investment project could be for greening and find a way to determine at what point we would call that investment project a green project. And that is where the 50% comes in. The idea being the majority of the investment expenditure is for to support the green objectives. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Witter. And I, I'm looking in the chat and I'm realizing that many of the other comments I've seen are really statements. Um, so we will not repeat those and, and persons can go in the chat and, and look at those uh, those comments. So there, I don't see any more questions um, to Dr. Witter. Um, well, Gillian, Gillian yes, could we, yes, we okay. make sure that we collate all questions and suggestions so that we can Yes. Uh, see how they can we work into the draft. Yes, and in fact, we're recording the session. We're recording the session, so that is going to be um, done, and so we will have that available. So, yes, Dr. Witto. So, thank you, everyone, for your questions to Dr. Witto um, on the, um, the the draft document. Again, I am indicating to you and inviting you to please send your written comments. Um, this document for us is a very important one. It is not our intention to put it on a shelf. We actually want it to be utilized by those um, authorities who are directly involved in, in investments in the country. And so we are really inviting and encouraging you to provide your written comments on the document that we have in front of us. Um, so thank you very much again for, the, for that um, question and answer segment, which I think was very, very interesting and informative. Um, we now have Minister uh, Pernell Charles's um, keynote address, so we are going to play his video message and thereafter we will go into our panel discussion. Good day everyone, uh, Pernell Charles Jr. here, and I want to firstly acknowledge our moderator, uh, Ms. Gillian Guthrie, my Chief Technical Director from the Ministry of Housing, urban renewal, environment, and climate change. Acknowledgements as well to Mr. Peter Thompson, CEO of RADA, Dr. David Smith, the Director for the Center of Environmental Management from UWE, Mr. Brian Bernard, AVP of Planning and Design from the Port Authority of Jamaica, and Mr. David Barrett, Energy and Environment Consultant from Enbar Consulting, and of course, Dr. Michael Witter, uh, the Natural Resource Economist, and the National Green Economy Investment Consultant. And good day to all of you who are joining us and participating in this very important forum virtually. It is my pleasure to address you today at the National Green Economy Investment Virtual Workshop, hosted by my ministry, the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change, in collaboration with NEPA, the National Environment and Planning Agency. The workshop is being held under the government of Jamaica with a partnership with UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programs International Environment Technology Center. And this is all under the Plastic Waste Minimization Project. I am particularly happy that we're able to secure the participation of local experts in the field of agriculture, energy, natural resources, management, and the built environment, all to come together and share experiences as well as recommendations with respect to opportunities and measures for us as a group to address the gaps within our respective sectors in relation to, of course, this very important topic of green investments. So let me take the opportunity uh, to express my appreciation, particularly to Dr. Michael Witter, for the assistance that he has provided to the ministry in the development of this green economy investment strategy for Jamaica, uh, which he will share with you during uh, what I anticipate will be a very interesting um, and productive session. Uh, the development of a green economy investment strategy for our country is a follow-up to the green economy scoping study, which was completed four years ago in 2016. Um, and that was done with the kind support then of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. The study focused 
on five economic sectors, namely construction, agriculture, tourism, water, and energy. And it sought to assist policymakers in creation of enabling environment for increased investments in, in the transition for us, of course, towards a green economy. Indeed, the green economy investment strategy identifies opportunities within those economic sectors. It also recommends measures to maximize green investments to facilitate improved energy and resource efficiency, for it to create decent jobs for our people, and to increase climate resilience, a very important topic for us, to eliminate the persistent poverty and to prevent the loss of our very special and important biodiversity and the ecosystem services. Uh, to aid in the country's transition towards this green economy that we seek, my ministry has been advancing um, and advocating for green investments as a critical tool in achieving sustainability and development. There is now increased urgency to accelerate this transition given the global thrust towards green and inclusive economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. This requires us in part uh, to have the development and execution of green growth strategies by government, as well as the targeted use of limited public funds to leverage private financial flows, which is at the heart of the green growth transition. That's the balance that we must strike. So while the pandemic has posed serious economic and social challenges to countries, particularly small economically vulnerable countries like Jamaica, um, it has also presented to us opportunities for governments to implement recovery measures which are targeted at the green sectors and activities. This has been the focus of some regional uh, integration groupings, such as the European Union, um, and countries such as South Korea um, in the implementation of their respective green deals, which are generally aimed at a development of modern, resource efficient and competitive economies, uh, while at the same time addressing environmental challenges and climate change. Uh, the World Economic Forum in its 2013 Green Investment Report states, and I quote, greening investment at scale is a precondition for achieving sustainable growth. The investment required for water, agriculture, telecoms, power, transport, buildings, industrial and forestry sectors, according to current growth projections, stands at about 5 trillion US per year up to 2020. Such business as usual investment will not deliver stable growth and prosperity. So, New kinds of investments are needed, are relevant, and are required um, that also achieve sustainability goals. Beyond the known infrastructure investment barriers and constraints, the challenge for us will be uh, how we enable an unprecedented shift in long-term investment from the conventional to the green alternatives um, to avoid locking in less efficient emissions-intensive technologies for decades to come. Therefore, small island developing states like Jamaica, um, with our inherent limitations, including small size, narrow natural resource base, and a very high vulnerability to the impacts of climate change and natural disasters, as well as low economic resilience, we will be required to be innovative in attracting green investment at a scale that will assist the country in achieving its economic and fiscal growth targets, to assist us in ensuring social well-being for our people, while at the same time being responsive to the environmental and climate change challenges. Vision 2030 Jamaica uh, for our National Development Plan refers to the importance of the country transitioning towards uh, the green economy. In support of this effort, and coupled with the government's low carbon development strategy, um, a number of policy measures and initiatives have been instituted, including the development of a national policy on environmental management systems, 
and by the ministry in 2019. This policy is being implemented by NEPA in close collaboration with key partners within the public and private sectors. Additionally, NEPA has instituted the Green Business Jamaica Program, GBJ, which encourages public and private sector entities to adopt environmentally friendly practices and encourages them to adhere to sustainable consumption and productive practices. And this is very important. The GBJ is recognized, therefore, as a key element in supporting the private sector to comply with the national and international standards. And this will be increasing their competitiveness and the creation of business opportunities to drive long-term economic growth. Notwithstanding these efforts, much, much more needs to be done in mainstreaming the green economy into the key economic and social policies and strategies. There's also need for us to develop a green public procurement policy for Jamaica, which would uh, seek to reduce the environmental impacts of government operations and to promote environmental goals by integrating environmental considerations within the procurement process. Given that the government is the single largest consumer of goods and services, the adoption of green procurement practices would see the investment of our public funds in purchasing green goods, services, and infrastructure, which could have a positive knock-on effect on how the private sector does business. I'd like to take a very quick look at two economic sectors in which Jamaica has made strides and for which opportunities exist for the increase in the green investments, namely the energy and the construction sectors. As you are aware, the government has a revised energy target of 50% of our energy use being generated from renewable sources by 2030. In this regard, uh, the country has seen significant investments in renewable energy, including wind, solar, and hydro. Indeed, Jamaica boasts the largest solar project in the English-speaking Caribbean, and that is our Paradise Park in Savannah Lamar, which is designed to supply 51.5 megawatts of power, or 6% of our island's production capacity. Additionally, the government will be advancing the use of alternative fuel sources in the transportation sector, as well as the promotion of electric mobility this is very important. In this regard, the private sector is being encouraged to invest in the development of the necessary infrastructure, including the installation of charging stations and ports, as well as the maintenance facilities to serve e-vehicles. Another sector with significant opportunities for green investment is the construction sector. Investments will be needed to provide eco-friendly and eco-efficient materials for housing and industry. Standards which promote environmentally friendly practices within the sector, for example, uh, leadership in energy and environmental design, should be mandated. So the enactment of the 2018 Building Act allows for the adoption and efficient application of a National Building Code of Jamaica. It is a very important step for us to ensure that this code reflects the green approach to construction. So the government must now create the right enabling conditions for a green economy transition, which would stimulate and generate green investments and green jobs. Please permit me to borrow a well-used line from the movie Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. Uh, these enabling conditions will involve the development of effective public bodies, including the green fiscal policies, which can elicit uh, behavioral change and enhance the speed with which the country moves towards a green economy, including the imposition of environmental taxes, uh, pollution charges, uh, green subsidies, the elimination of environmentally harmful subsidies, uh, public expenditure on infrastructure, 
tax rebates directly to the consumer, and preferential corporation tax rate for qualified businesses. Some of these fiscal measures have already been applied to Jamaica. Um, however, where necessary and appropriate, uh, such measures should be periodically reviewed to ensure that the objectives for which they are intended are met. Uh, additionally, important prerequisites in the engagement of the private sector include the availability of a cadre of trained professionals who are knowledgeable about the relevant statutory requirements um, and have acquired the skills that are required to effectively interact with professionals, um, contractors, artisans, at all levels um, of the development scheme. Um, and this is very critical because it will ensure adherence with the very important requirements. There's also the need for us to have increased access to data and to information to support uh, and foster green investments. Effective communication, increased awareness, and knowledge are also important elements that must be in place to respond to the new opportunities in key economic sectors where green investments are promoted and encouraged. Development, access to, and transfer of clean technologies are also essential prerequisites of a green economy. Therefore, investments in research and development to allow for the production and the use of these technologies is critical and recommended. It is my hope that the Green Economy Investment Strategy will be used as a companion uh, to the national investment policy that's been developed by the Ministry of Industry and Commerce. Uh, I am also anticipating that public sector entities like JAMPRO will find this strategy very, very relevant to them in their dialogue with investors who seek and have interest in Jamaica. Uh, let me close by saying to you that I wish for you a productive workshop. I look forward to all of the outcomes from the workshop. Um, and I bid you all season's greetings. Uh, stay safe. Enjoy the time with your loved ones um, as we look forward to a brighter, more prosperous, and a happy new year. All the best. Um, thank you to Minister um, Honorable Pernell Charles Jr. for his address to um, the, the workshop. So now our colleagues, we are going to move on to our panel discussion. And in fact, we are very happy and honored that we have some key expert, experts who could share with us um, their views on green investments within the Jamaican context and in some key economic sectors. So we're going to speak today about the energy sector, the construction sector, and the agriculture sector. So um, to start off, and he's already on the screen um, before us, is um, we're privileged to have Dr. David Smith with us um, today. And Dr. David Smith will provide an overview on green investment and the strategy um, to be applied. And Dr. David Smith is well known. I mean, Dr. Smith is the director of the Center for Environmental Management and coordinate, uh, coordinator of the Institute for Sustainable Development at the University of the West Indies, Mona. He, is, he was a member of the independent group of scientists that produced the United, Na United Nations Global Sustainable Development Report for 2019 and is currently on the Science and Policy Advisory Committee of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. He worked on sustainable development focuses on managing disaster risk, environmental management, and effects of climate change on human well being, mainly in small island developing states. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for joining us, and over to you for your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thanks very much. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I'm going to try and be brief as possible. Uh, I like the terminology about greening the economy because it, I, I do sometimes worry that there are people who feel that there is a real economy and then there may be also a green economy, a blue economy or an orange economy. And these are special kinds of economies, but the real economy is the one that we're pursuing now. So yes, we are about trying to make the economy that we are pursuing 
become a lot more green. The Global Sustainable Development Report reminds us that we shouldn't just try to pursue individual sustainable development goals. We should use entry points instead. Those entry points are energy, sustainable and just economies, the food production uh, chain, cities and communities, the environmental global commons and human well-being. And what we are really looking for at the moment, at least maybe in the context here, is for government to decouple GDP growth from conversion of environmental resources and create GDP growth that does not lead to increased waste, to a loss of biological diversity, and of course does not increase inequality. One of the problems that we've seen is that our current economy and the current economy pursued by many countries in the world has increased inequality quite a lot and this leads to all manner of socioeconomic problems. So government needs to find ways of uh, creating incentives, using penalties, uh, changing its current subsidies and its perverse incentives to move GDP away from what it's doing at the moment if it's um, converting environmental resources and creating a loss. That might include measuring economic growth and well, human well-being in other ways rather than GDP, possibly using the Human Development Index, for example, which has now just come out with an added aspect to it, which allows us to look at planetary health and looking at multidimensional poverty indices, for example. It may also require looking at specific important aspects of the economy. So for example, tourism. Tourism gets quite a lot of breaks because it provides employment but one of our problems is that the rent that we charge hotels and beachfront users doesn't cover the cost of maintaining the coastal environment. It's not covering the cost of maintenance of mangroves or coral reefs. And as a result, we see beachfront eroding and continuing to erode as we are continuing to uh, use it for tourism. This is going to affect tourism as well as all the other things that depend on the coastal environment, like fisheries, for example. Government has to encourage investment then in things that are longer term and better suited for long term development, which might, for example, mean um, encouraging the tourism sector to actually pay for the maintenance of the coastal environment and not using the current system. We've heard some interesting works uh, so far about things like energy. Uh, we might want to look as well at if we are using, say, for example, hydroelectricity, how much money that is generated by hydroelectricity goes to protecting the watershed that provides the water for that hydroelectricity. Are we creating and investing more in human capital? One of the problems that we realized under COVID, and it was, um, I think, put out in the IDB report, is that as COVID attacks tourism, Jamaica was singled out as a place which has a major problem because most of our tourism workers lack the skills to transfer to other sectors. It speaks to our need to build human capital, and that means investing more in training and building education so that people are more able to take advantage of opportunities, particularly those that might relate from science and technology. Finally, just want to think through a couple of things. If we are completely dependent on coastal environments, or at least highly dependent on coastal environments, we definitely need to watch the perverse incentives there. We'd already heard about mining, whether it be for bauxite or for other minerals. We really do need to put together a proper policy and stick to it and avoid incentivizing poor behavior and start incentivizing better behavior. We need to look at the increase in inequality because that has a negative effect on personal security. It drives crime and violence and affects social mobility. So if we're looking for a green economy, the bottom line is that it is a multi-dimensional problem that requires um, transdisciplinary approaches and multidisciplinary approaches. 
It's not something that can be done by, say, a Ministry of Environment alone. The entire machinery of government needs to be brought to bear on this. There are no ministries or agencies of government that are not involved in the green economy. Either they're for it or either that by their inaction or they're not getting involved, they're against it. And since I only was given five minutes, I'm going to stop there and hope that um, the uh, panel will be able to pick up on some of those points. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. And, and we will, Dr. Smith, give you a chance again to um, uh, make further comments. Um, what we're going to do is to just um, introduce all the panelists, so one at a time, of course, and then we will ask questions afterwards. And then you would please tell us um, to which panel um, panelists that you would like to direct your question. And of course, we'll invite Dr. Dr. Smith at that time again to make any additional comments that he think is appropriate at that time. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So our next panelist is um, Dr. Mr. Uh, Peter Thompson. Uh, Mr. Thompson is presently the Chief Executive Officer of the Rural Agricultural Development Authority, RADA. He has over 29 years ex of experience working with RADA, 15 of which are at the senior management level. He started out as an extension officer in St. Thomas and has worked up through the ranks. And Mr. Thomas has represented Jamaica and RADA on several overseas assignments, some of which include agricultural support services in Cairo, Egypt, South-South Food Security Summit in Colombia, ICT Conference on Agriculture in the Netherlands and Ethiopia, as well as the use of IT solutions for agriculture in Suriname. So we're very, very happy to have Mr. Thomas with us, and he will give us his perspective on green investments in the agriculture sector. Mr. Thomas, please. All right, good, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, friends online. Um, my perspective on the green investment is such that um, you're looking at, you know, things that companies, things that individuals do that are more in line with environmental development rather than degradation. In terms of agriculture, um, it's one of the areas that we have seen a lot of challenges, um, especially the destruction of trees. Um, as you know, trees are very important to attract um, rain to protect soil, um, the soil structure, and to maintain stability in the hills. Um, during my almost 30 years of working with agriculture, I have seen significant degradation of, of land, especially in the hilly interiors. As you know, that approximately 80% of our farmers operate in, in the hills and steep hillside um, soils. And they have been part of the destruction of the watershed areas. Now, we have to look at policies and the government have to implement policies and programs and are very much in line with environmental sustainability for future generation. And um, in terms of looking at preserving and protecting biodiversity, which we try to promote through our extension services. Um, policies have to support um, these initiatives. As you rightly um, said in the opening remarks that, you know, one of the areas that government need to focus on is policy. And policy has very much to be in line with greening the environment. Um, one of the things that I think, you know, government can do, I heard Dr. Witter alluded to it earlier, is to offer incentives to organizations and companies um, to go green. To what extent that can be done, I don't know, is something that we have to discuss. And would it mean taking, you know, away from the browning of the economy and giving to greening, which we have already, you know, very much um, known about. I mean, the bauxite company I, I listen have been doing a lot of work in Jamaica over the last couple of years. But has that work benefit the economy, benefit the country? It is something that we need to consider. 
in terms of offering of incentives to companies, we are looking at ways in which that can be done, whether to offer um, incentives in the form of bonds, um, looking at mutual fund um, or other sort of investment that would more align with the greening of the economy. Now, in, in, in our organization, RADA, we try to promote sustainable land management as a way of protecting the soil structure and the environment for future generations. And through our extension services delivery, we encourage and train farmers and we organize them in groups because we believe that through this um, you know, whole issue of group concept, we can get more by you know, broadcasting what we do more efficiently. We also try to educate community stakeholders for them to adopt practices that will protect the environment. One of the things that I see the government is trying to push right now is a massive tree planting program, which more or less have greater good for the economy, for the country on a whole. One, we are looking at planting not only trees for lumber, but also economic trees. The farmers will not destroy the economic trees. You can plant food forests, but the lumber, when the lumber trees are planted, um, sooner or later they will be cut and used for coal burning and other activities which leave the soil bare. We have seen as a result of climate change, the huge movement of soil from top land to lower land, high levels of siltation we have observed. And we have to arrest these situation and the best way of doing it is to implement programs and policies and offer incentives to companies that are involved in you know, the, the whole environmental destruction. We have seen the, the whole issue of coffee plantation up in the hills of St. Andrew and St. Thomas and in some areas of the Blue Mountain, what it has done in terms of you know, shifting the rainfall pattern in those regions to the point where we have unpredictable weather. Uh, it's something that we have to, to, to look at. And we believe that education and training should be an area that we focus on heavily. I know that some of our farmers in agriculture are adapting to climate change and are putting in mitigation strategies, especially in the, in the area of water harvesting and soil conservation. But we need to do more. And I think the government should take the lead in terms of you know, getting out there persons getting out there the programs that would promote this type of investment, sustainable agricultural production. Because it's all good when we go out there and try our bit, but we need the backing of the government in order to create that. And we believe that any sustainable development in agriculture, for that matter, the government should set the framework for these investments. So that any deviation from agreed practices, there should be some sanctions or penalty to those. So that is it for my little bit until the question and answer session comes in. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. And um, th thank you for giving us an overview as to what is happening in the agricultural sector from, from RADA's perspective. Um, so now we're going to have another local expert. Um, this time we're going to focus in on the energy sector and we are honored to have um, Mr. David Barrett. Uh, Mr. David Barrett is an energy and environment project manager for over 25 years and has a master's in energy and environment from the University of Calgary, Canada. 
and a master's in zoology. He's a certified energy manager and has consulted with IDB, USAID, UNDP, and UNEP, and was previously manager of energy and environment at the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica. And Doc, Mr. Barrett is a principal consultant of NBAR Consulting. Uh, Mr. Barrett, please. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks for the invitation to this important workshop. I believe a number of key points for the energy sector has have already been um, touched on. So I'll only take the opportunity to just hone in on some areas. Now, for us to have a green economy, we have to have an economy that works in the first place. And the starting of any kind of green economy must be energy efficiency. The good news is that Jamaica has already advanced um, its building code and as Minister already mentioned, the building code is, is an in, important platform for going forward in terms of how our buildings are designed, how our buildings are cooled. And it's important to note that cooling in particular demands up to 40 or six, 40 to 60% of the total building energy cooling requirements. And that's become um, a critical area to target in any green economy. Another aspect that should be considered is a fairly low hanging fruit, and that is on-site water harvesting and management. The NWC uses a significant amount of the total um, electrical um, supply just to pump water, whereas it's possible to do water harvesting and management on site to reduce that. So I would say energy efficiency is a very low hanging fruit and the beginning for any green strategy for um, economy. It's also important that we shift um, in the models that we have for the grid. We have utilized a central grid type model which depends on fossil fuel. And I suppose that is some kind of um, black economy based on the color of the, the fuel. We have moved more towards green in adding renewables and we have added natural gas, which is cleaner than fossil, but um, perhaps not our very best opportunity because we have a lot of renewable potentials. It's very important then to decentralize the national grid, focus on renewables and their opportunities. Um, JPS is talking about um, smart grids. We have microgrid opportunities. There are distributed generation resources as in systems which are um, on buildings, specifically um, at the locations of demand. And these are significant opportunities. There's also very good news for decentralizing um, towards a green economy. And that is we have legislative inputs like power wheeling, which has yet to be activated or implemented. We have net billing, which is, but needs to be clarified, but I'm sure that's something that can be done. And a very good piece of news being that the integrated resource plan um, has now been um, put out in the public. And the signal there is 133, sorry, 1,334 megawatts of renewables will be added by 2037, whereas a smaller portion of natural gas will be added. So there's a clear signal that we're moving towards more renewables in a decentralized um, grid model. Another thing that's very important, another low hanging fruit, which we have not been able to pick for a long time, and that is waste management. If we consider a circular type of waste management model, then what we should be doing is moving from a linear option, which is we use materials, we create wastes, those wastes go into our dumps and they take up land. We have fire issues, we have health issues and move to a circular option in this green economy where materials which have some energy value can be utilized. Things like tires, lumber, gardening, cotton, paper, plastics, etc. Those things which can be um, combusted at high temperatures in a paralytic way with, as in without the use of oxygen. And their outputs are more environmentally acceptable. We can utilize that in our green economy. So what we probably should be heading for in that case is a, a smaller systems, five to 10 megawatts, so that we can avoid having to need fossil fuel to make that um, economic. But there are some things to be started out, things like the investment cost, tipping fees, and so on, 
but it's something that's done in other countries. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a no brainer and it's something that we can do in Jamaica towards our green economy. It was already mentioned, um, clean uh, mobility within a green economy. And so JPSCO, for example, has made it clear that they're putting out um, public charging stations, uh, entities like ATL have indicated they're gonna bring in um, high-end uh, electric vehicle models. JPSCO actually has a, a, a working committee on this and there are persons who have hybrids, which is a transition towards that. But we can move further um, vehicle to grid, as in using your vehicle for storage or you know um, uh, charging your home, for example, if you need to. And again, the focus would have to be on renewable energy um, as a source in order for that to be clean. But then also in clean mobility must be the inclusion of um, the biofuels, bioethanol and biodiesel. I know the IDB is um, working on uh, electric mobility, but also transportation management so that um, lights, for example, can be controlled. People don't have to be waiting for long periods at stoplights. So that's another low hanging fruit, but it's something that's already in train and I see developing rapidly within the next five years. But critical then for this green economy, when we look at energy, is we have to revision our national energy policy. The energy policy has done very well. It has um, successfully achieved a number of its targets. But at this point in time, it is somewhat outdated because a number of the technologies we have now, we didn't have then, um, which we should be able to incorporate. We should be able to incorporate more renewables um, than the 20%, which was in the policy, than the 30%, which has been said and more than the 50%, which the, the prime minister has um, supported. And so the integrated resource plan signals this direction. Also renewables should uh, speak to the opportunity for decentralizing. And it was already mentioned that the blue economy, sustainable consumption and production concepts and energy sector resilience should all be incorporated in a revisioned national energy policy. And then finally, as the other platform, we have very good policies, we have good frameworks, we have good strategies, but they all need to be harmonized in a way that they have the same climate change, same environmental and same energy goals. So we talk about Vision 2030. Um, PIOJ has been very effective in keeping this on the front burner in doing the, the midterm evaluations um, and, and keeping us on track. And it's been um, the, the document that's kept Jamaica going in a greener path. But as I mentioned, national energy policy needs to be revisioned. We have um, other things like the National Determined Contribution Climate Change Framework, National Cooling Strategy, and all of these are leading us on the right path. So I think we're on the right path for the measure of a green economy that we want to achieve um, um, the comments about the colors, the blues and the greens and the browns have already been mentioned, but I think we're heading in the right direction towards a greener economy and energy is right on the plate. We are doing some things. We have some near term um, low hanging fruits and we have some things already on the books for the near future. So I'll leave it there for any questions. Thank you. Great. Good, thank you very much, um, Mr. Barrett. And uh, we are looking forward to the questions that will be posed to all of, all, all of our presenters. So next up, um, we're honored to have Mr. Brian Bernal. And this is, a, this is one of the areas that we, unfortunately, Mr. Bernal, we don't have a, a chance to discuss with you very often about uh, environment and construction. So this is a very, very, uh, we're waited with bated breath to hear from you about uh, green investments in, in the construction sector. But um, Mr. Bernal um, is the Assistant Vice President Planning and Design at the Port Authority of Jamaica. Um, he has responsibility for planning, development and implementation of a diverse range of projects, including commercial buildings for the BPO sector, master plans for large scale urban projects, renovation stroke expansion of existing near port facilities, and the development of new attractions and destinations for cruise shipping. And Mr. Bernal is a certified engineer and architect, 
and a lead accredited professional in building design and construction. Uh, welcome, Mr. Bernal, and please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me, and thank you for that introduction. Good afternoon again to all persons on the, the call. I'm very happy to be here, and I've learned a lot in the past two hours. So I just want to add my small component to it in terms of the ways that I see that the construction sector and the building sector can, um, can help us to, to move towards a green economy. I was fortunate enough to have um, participated in the scoping study and many of the points that were raised in the scoping study still remain true today. A lot of the issues have been touched on by in, in the previous presentation. So I will try to abridge my speaking points just to make sure that I um, reinforce the critical areas that I see having the greatest impact on the construction sector and the areas that have the greatest potential for, um, in, for in this sector. So certainly codes and standards are a big part of it. I see that as one of the clearest routes to greening our construction sector. First of all, we need to make sure that we enforce the national building codes and uh, um, reinforce the importance of the energy conservation code, which is part of the national building code. However, I don't think that goes far enough. We need to find a way to, or uh, we should also be encouraging the use of some, a green building rating system, something that is easy to use something that um, gives uh, metrics that we, that we are easily out, you know, output is a metric or quantitative, sorry, and something that we can then move towards making it mandatory for all public projects. In addition to just making it mandatory, we want to also find ways to incentivize the private sector to voluntarily adopt these green building standards for their projects. A lot of work has been done in different jurisdictions about the, whether private or public projects drive green construction. And I'm proposing that it is a combination of both, mandatory in certain instances and incentivized incentives for the private sector to make it easier for them to do um, green projects. They see the benefit of green projects. They're not always readily apparent in the short term, but in the long term, you know, over the life cycle of projects, we can see the value of these green building practices and initiatives in the projects. So I mentioned green building rating system, and I think sometimes these can be intimidating for persons in the construction sector, persons in general who are not familiar, the, there is a growing awareness of what green building rating systems do. But in our particular jurisdiction, I was heartened to see that um, the IFC's EDGE system has done a lot to simplify the system to reduce the cost of implementing a green building rating system such as the edge system. And it allows the integration of that process of, of getting accredited or getting certified into the, into the, the practice of design in the building. So I think it's a, a good um, option for us targeting countries like Jamaica with a growing economy, but not perhaps at the top end of the scale in terms of the most expensive green technologies being integrated into their projects. So I think we, we heard earlier in the, in the discussion in Dr. Witter's component, and again, how do we, you know, grappling with the definition of green investment. The same thing happens in construction in that we're often 
you know, there are challenges with the term, what is a green building? Is it a green project? How green is it? So it, it can often be used in a vague way and is not clearly defined by metrics. That's why these rating systems that provide quantitative results are important. In addition to that, the fact that we don't often have the, the measurables of these projects leads to another area that I think we can emphasize in, the government could emphasize going forward and I think would be important for us, which is to build the type of skills that actually help to measure the outputs and inputs into green buildings. So in addition to the role of encouraging the use of codes, standards, and green building rating systems, it would be important to put emphasis on training of persons with skills which match the type of technologies that will be used in green building. Things such as energy auditing, building energy modeling, you know, tracking the water consumption in a building, doing occupancy reports to establish the performance of the green building and the measures that are designed into the building. And finally, ensuring that the systems that are put in place actually perform as they are designed. So these are not um, skills which uh, are new, necessarily new skills, but they would be specialized in terms of focusing on these green components. These are you know, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, air conditioning. These skills focus on those systems. And we have to be aware that systems are an increasing part of any building project. In addition to skills, in terms of, I yeah, would term those engineering skills, we need to, to green our economy. We also need to have persons and different types of skills in the planning of projects, planning both at a macro scale and at a project scale. So in terms of, in terms of planning for a sustainable way forward, I think it'd be critical to look at the design and planning of green projects and the skills required for a building project and also at the wider community level, we need to make sure that we integrate sustainability of our urban spaces. And to do that, we have to find ways to transition towards a more resource efficient, uh, low carbon and a more inclusive, I was very heartened to see the, the social component in what Dr. Witter presented, um, a more inclusive and socially just uh, cities and urban spaces. And the, the final point I'd want to make is, Dr. Witter in his presentation spoke about shifting incentives. Incentives would have been a, 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 a big component of, of, I mentioned earlier about getting the private sector on board with green building. However, we need to seriously look at the financial, reducing the financial burden of, for green projects. How do we make it more attractive for persons to participate in building green rather than in the old inefficient way? Are there ways that we can give developers bonuses, greater uh, density or other things which would which which would benefit them economically benefit us by ensuring that the green building standards are met and that we're building in a, a more sustainable way we also look need to look at campus solutions I, I bring this one up particularly because many of the new codes many of the parts of the code require certain types of uh, technologies in your building. And uh, let me give you a, an example. We, the codes, fire sprinklers are increasing part of, of every project. And what we see happening is that each project needs to put in its own fire water tank to, um, to, to service the fire sprinkler system. It would be more efficient if we could plan and look at ways to develop campus solutions where a single large water storage tank could support multiple buildings or multiple developments. So this is what I'm talking about, reducing the financial burden for green projects. We want to make sure that we have solutions that can be, be scaled. So those are the key points. Uh, I think 
in, in, in closing, I just want to say that we also need to make sure we, we can recognize, find ways to talk about the successes that we have in green projects, making sure that we can recognize and publicize where green buildings, green building initiatives have been important, have been incorporated and have been done successfully. So thank you. And I look forward to talking more in the panel discussion. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernal. And that was a very, very informative uh, presentation. All our panelists have been very, very informative. And again, we thank you very much for um, sharing your expertise with us on this very important um, national topic. So now the floor is open to participants to pose questions to the panelists. What I will do first, however, is to give Dr. Smith um, an opportunity to make any um, further statements that he would like um, in respect of this matter before we actually open the floor for, for questions to the, to the panelists. Dr. Smith, um, would you like to make any further statements? Dr. Smith, um, would you like to make any um, not really. I think um, anything I would have said has been covered very well by the subsequent panelists. I think the only thing to mention is that we must make sure that once we put out policies, we have to implement them and make sure that they are properly implemented comprehensively. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, so the, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, please feel free to put your questions in the chat or to raise your hand and I will give you the floor and please advise me as to which panelist um, the question is directed at. Nakasha, I will ask you to help me to monitor the chat as well, please, to be sure that I, I see any hands. Sure, sure, sure. So who would like to go first? <laughs> no questions coming in. Okay, great. All right. So uh, we got a question here from Alistair Scott to Dr. Smith. Um, have there been discussions with the tourism industry players about how they can become sustainable? Um, I'm not absolutely sure about that. I know I've uh, seen a few discussions which weren't part of a larger picture. Uh, there were discussions about, for example, how to deal with various environmental problems. For example, uh, the seasonal problem of sargassum washing up on beaches. And I think that there probably is room for having a, a broader discussion about how the entire industry can become sustainable. And here I'm talking not just about the aspects of taking care of the environmental um, resources that lead to or make tourism possible, but also how do we upskill the workers involved? How do we make sure their livelihoods are much more resilient to um, uh, things such as cyclones and downturns such as what we're seeing at the moment? But um, I'm not absolutely sure how much of that discussion has taken place. Uh, Julian? Yes, Mr. Barrett, please. Yes, so just a comment that um, the national cooling strategy was built um, with a consideration that entities like the tourism sector uh, puts out about 60% of their, their budget just for cooling. And so that's something that we find a number of the hotels are trying to improve on their energy efficiency for cooling. Also, you have uh, entities like the Palladium Hotel, which have put, um, I think it's 1.6 uh, megawatts of renewables on their roof. And there are a number of other hotels who are doing that or similar. And there are others which are trying to do energy recapture from um, hot water, et cetera. So there's some effort. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Mr. Barrett. Um, John L. Morgan from NEPA, um, she's making reference to the 2019 um, GSDR um, report that um, Dr. Smith had mentioned um, when he did his presentation. 
Um, and she's asking though, <clears throat> one, well, Dr. Dr. Witter, whether this report was um, utilized in preparing the draft that we have in front of us. Um, but the other question that she's asking is what percentage or how much focus is really placed on social implications for achieving a green economy. Without the people, there is no growth in the economy. So she's asking about the social issues and how that um, impacts upon us transitioning towards a green economy and, and in terms of green investments. So um, who would like to take um, that? I think Mr. Bernal at one point, he's talked about that he liked that Dr. Witter had um, included the social factor. Um, I don't know if you would like Mr. Bernal to start off, we'll go to Dr. Witter to ask him if he could also respond to that question. Mr. Bernal, would you like to take that question being that you had raised it at the end of your presentation? Um, could you just uh, repeat what was the, the, the question there? I lost you for a moment. Um, John L. Morgan is asking how much focus is really placed on social implications for achieving a green economy. And then she's making a statement without the people there, there is no growth in the economy. So she's well, asking the social factor. Sure, I, I, don't think, I, I don't think I can provide an answer for it, but I, I can reinforce the fact that um, especially, you know, we're talking about from a planning perspective, the value of, of a well-planned and a sustainable planned built environment in my opinion is it, it's invaluable and it will play an increasing role in what in the ongoing success of our community. So we know we can put in place infrastructural changes uh, and those, you know, in a similar way, putting in place uh, involving persons having a, a good social system um, in, in augurs well for a green community to continue and to thrive. So um, perhaps Dr. Wita can add some uh, to that point. Thanks, Mr. Bernal. Dr. Wita, do you want to um, chime in on this particular question? Ms. Gothra, I think you're muted. I was asking Dr. Witter then, is he around if he could then take um, a crack at this question by Ms. Morgan about the social implications of the transition? Are you hearing me now? Yes, yes, please, Dr. Witter. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I was talking to myself. I'm saying it is to Jamaica's credit that uh, inclusiveness is uh, an element of greenness on the same footing as reducing the carbon footprint. And in the investment strategy, we have tried to address inclusiveness by way of the development of the appropriate skills for the green technologies, as um, Brian um, referred to in his presentation, but also in terms of the investment process by networking um, small uh, and micro producers where possible to both large private and large public sector um, projects. Uh, for example, the farming, there's no reason farmers can be networked into um, land development projects to address some of the degradation that um, Mr. Thomas spoke to. Uh, and there's no reason that um, small, small producers uh, can be networked to large manufacturers, given the nature of uh, technology today that allows for um, real-time communication and um, the modularization of production systems. Indeed, I was actually teasing out the notion that for, for Jamaica's development, we have to begin to think more of 
networks of producers in order to get the scale effect while including the, the small producers who are the majority in the country and the major employers. So I think the, the green investment strategies inclusiveness addresses both the workers and the micro entrepreneurs. But it also addresses the household insofar as it speaks to household behavior as well as um, household behavior with respect to you know um, green activities and so on uh, but it also requires the, the the citizens to be educated uh, to begin to express their preferences such as demand for green products and green services um, much of what has happened in the tourist industry has driven been driven by a consciousness among international travelers for more environmental friendly services than historical has been given by the hotels. There are many examples of that that one can speak to. The other aspect, though, is the very important um, aspect of um, social stability. Without social stability, there is no macroeconomic stability and there is no investment, whether brown or green. And whereas at the level of the presentation today, one could only speak about um, the relevant develop the relevant social services. I don't think it's too hard to figure out that we're talking about um, employment and education um, for um, skill training and education for employment, um, upgrading of the settlements that people live in so they have a better sense of themselves. Um, issues of health, which I know on the front burner, the notion of um, um, public health, which we in Jamaica took for granted all along. We had such a good record in public health and suddenly now we see how vulnerable we are. So the education, health, general infrastructure of their communities, those are very important elements to get the kind of social stability that would make anybody want to invest in a place like Jamaica. So I certainly agree with you and I hope the investment strategy has done justice to the notion that central to the investment strategy must be people. And you also asked whether I had seen the global sustainability report for this report for the, um, in preparing this report. No, but I will look at it now. Thank you very much, Dr. Witter and um, Mr. Bernal for responding to that question, which was a very important one. Um, we have a couple questions, other questions in the chat. Um, um, Denise Forrest is um, um, indicating um, that implementation the importance of policy um, implementation to the success of the national green economy effort. And she's asking, is there an agreement regarding that observation? And is that matter, meaning more effective policy development, coordination, execution be given priority attention? Um, so I, I know for a fact that the cabinet office does monitor um, policy um, development and implementation. Um, MDAs are required to report on their progress in developing policies that have been approved by cabinet for development and how it is that after they have been finalized and approved, um, how it is that we are implementing those policies. Um, it may be necessary for us to have a more robust approach um, because it does happen that policies are developed but they are not fully implemented for whatever reason. So there may need to be a more robust check and balance on in terms of, of policies which are um, approved by cabinet for um, development and their actual implementation once um, they are finalized. So that may need to be done. And also probably um, a more a scan of the landscape, a better scan of the landscape to talk about the um, relevance of policies being developed. Um, that is something that um, um, will change over time as we evolve but sometimes the policy development process takes so long in Jamaica that sometimes by the time we've developed the policies, a lot of the things that the policies are supposed to speak to have already been um, done or not done. So, um, so this is an area that I think we need to have greater um, emphasis on, but there is a system in place to monitor already by the cabinet office, anything approved by the cabinet for development and the implementation once it, once it is developed. Um, the other question that I see in the chat is um, 
a question from um, Dr. Rodriguez um, asking how is the financial sector being targeted to contribute to the green economy outside of green loans, but focusing on how and where they invest funds. So probably um, Dr. Witter, you could try to take that first and then we can um, go down to the other panelists to see um, there if they have any input on this particular question. So how is the financial sector being targeted to contribute to the green economy outside of green loans, but focusing on how and where they invest funds? So Dr. Witter, could you start this please? Um, panelists, if they well, could. Are, their are you hearing me now? Yes, yes, Dr. Witter, we're hearing uh, there, you. There is um, already uh, initiatives to develop green bonds, which is to raise financing for, uh, for green investments. But one of the things is that's being proposed here is that uh, DBJ be charged with being the focal point for mobilizing green finance, both internationally and locally, in much the same way that it has performed for developing, for mobilizing finance for the micro sector, micro, small and medium enterprises. Um, they, they should play that role for centrally mobilizing international and local finance for green projects. Uh, this is not a, a, a novel, a new idea. Many countries have set up institutions to do exactly that, like Rwanda, Indonesia. And in our case, rather than create a new institution where there's a vehicle that is already has certain kinds of capabilities like that, we are suggesting that DBJ be that um, institution. Now, that would also mean, of course, that DBJ would develop the relevant memoranda of understanding with the large commercial institutions um, and be able to collect the relevant data for us to monitor um, the progress in implementing the green economy investment strategy. Because one of the challenges is that, you know, the data collection process in the country lags behind whenever we open new areas of development. Uh, but you need the data in order to monitor what is happening to make corrective action and so on. So to say that we suggest that DBJ plays this role is really taking on a lot of responsibilities that it itself may not be able to do, but it can do in partnership with um, the other institutions in the country. Bank of Jamaica would obviously have to play some role and so on like that. But yes, we, we do speak to it directly um, at the level of the proposal. Obviously, when you go further down the line, these things have to be detailed more and um, timetabled according to what the realities are on the ground. Dr. Witter, um, Mr. Barrett from the energy sector, Mr. Thompson from the agriculture sector, um, would you like to um, contribute to the response to this question? Uh, I can Mr. comment Barrett? quickly on um, a couple of the um, locations. So DBJ probably has been Jamaica's largest champion for green financing and they, they do so by providing um, you know, very low interest um, financing for energy efficiency, renewable systems, energy audits. I am also aware that um, NHD also gives um, support for renewable energy systems, particularly hot water systems. And the PV, um, there's a little challenge for PV in that if you already have a loan, um, you with NHD, you are not able to access the solar PV loan, but um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, negotiation to get NHD to move that because perhaps the best time for you to get a PV system is when you are buying your house rather than a retrofit type of idea. Then you have a number of um, private entities, NGOs, associations applying to be part of the green climate funding recognized entities. And so a lot of that is happening specifically for green funding and just among the commercial banks, I know that, for example, JMB, um, uh, First Global Bank, have advertised clear green portfolios. So there's some interest there. And there's one other um, initiative that could come to Jamaica soon in us called Cooling as a Service on the National Cooling Strategy, where um, a person doesn't own the equipment, but they pay the, for the value of the cooling or the air conditioning that they obtain. And so it it takes that investment cost, the capital, 
off their balance sheets, um, enabling them to get calling and to decide at a later date whether they want to obtain equipment or not. So those are there. Thank you very much, Mr. Barrett. Um, very informative. Uh, Mr. Thompson, in the agriculture sector, um, would you like to contribute to the response to that question about where uh, not only the green loans, but where the where the um, focusing on how and where these funds should be invested in the agriculture sector? Uh, Mr. Thompson. I just have to make a, a comment. I agree with. Um, Dr. Thompson, sorry, could you speak a little bit louder? Yes, are you hearing me clearly? Clearly. Hearing you, but it's a little bit low still, but try, you can go ahead. Yes, I, I'm saying I agree with um, Dr. Witter, but one of the things I would advocate for is for some form of incentives to be given to those persons who are going to take up um, loans. I agree that the DBJ should be the lead financial institution for, you know, this whole promotion of the green economy in terms of financing. But there should be, for the banks, there should be some level of incentives for them to disburse loans or grants to, institu to institutions who want to take up um, monies for green projects. But I'm also recommending that there should be some incentives for those organizations um, taking up um, funding for green projects so that it can stimulate and motivate others to get involved. So there should be some form of, you know, help along the way, along that line for both the donor and for the recipients. And I think um, one of the areas that I strongly believe that should be targeted is sustainable agriculture. And by that, I mean the planting of permanent crops and also the planting of permanent trees in the watershed areas. Because as you know, the watersheds, areas of Jamaica supports water for agriculture as well as for other domestic use. And if we ignore that, by 2030, we have a 2030 vision. By 2030, we will be scouring the ground for water and there will be no water. So we need to protect the watershed areas. And the only way of doing that is to offer incentives to organizations, companies, individuals to take on projects to rehabilitate and restore tree planting of permanent trees in watershed areas. And by permanent, I mean food tree crops as well as crops for lumber. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Thanks for that. Um, very, very, um, another perspective again as to where we should be challenging these investments in a critical area, which is watershed uh, management. Um, so we have another question in the chat. Um, this is from um, Keisha and Thompson. Um, this is to Mr. Bernal. Um, she says, in terms of the social implications, inclusiveness from the perspective of buildings and the new law, um, could Mr. Bernal indicate how building would be more efficient, energy efficient, while taking into account the needs of persons with disabilities? For example, um, stairs, um, stairs versus lifts. Maybe this could could show how uh, we can make the balance or how we have to think about the impact on the disabled community. So she's asking how it is that in the in, in trying to green our, our infrastructure, how it is that we take into account some of the more vulnerable uh, persons within our society. Well, I, I, I think that the, the key point that I'd want to raise, uh, maybe it's not a direct answer to the question, is that you know codes, the, the purpose of a code is to create a, a, a minimum acceptable standard. You know, it's a compilation of best practices, and we want to emphasize that we're setting the minimum acceptable standard for, for buildings. Things such as making a building accessible are 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 part of that minimum acceptable standard. It's not a matter of, of something that it, it has to be a give and take. 
projects can be planned, meeting the needs of persons without being energy inefficient. They can, we can look at projects as, as a, uh, you know, a building or a development as a whole, and we can balance the areas where you need to use energy, the areas where you can save energy. So I don't think it's a either or in this particular case or a, a, a versus. I think what it is, is we need to accept that the, there is a minimum standard and that accessibility is, a, is part of that. And it should be part of any project, any good design that, that is a modern project being implemented. So not a versus, but, mm -hmm. uh, but an important part nonetheless. Great, thanks Mr. Bernal. Um, last question in our chat. Um, is anyone working on the issue of bringing a systems perspective to these fundamental issues? The fundamental issues are health, um, systems of health, including circular sustainable approaches to agriculture and primary health services, uh, healthcare services, for example. Um, this, this uh, Mr. Scott is saying it seems to be um, fundamental. Um, if we raise a level of positive and negative feedback when considering policies and thinking consciously about how industries and players interact, um, interact to ar arrive at good outcomes seems to be something which needs to be more explicit. So what he's asking is whether we are, whether we're working on issues of bringing a systems approach to these, some of these fundamental issues that we have been discussing today. Um, Dr. Dr. Witter, you want to take that one first and start us off and probably Dr. Smith. Dr. Witter, you're muted. I'm saying that's that that's a very big question. I don't know how you to suggest they approach it. Maybe we could start to talk about um he's mentioning some things like approaches to agriculture, for instance, and uh, and primary healthcare services. So probably could do it from a sector approach. Well, you know, it depends on one has to I think that an important part of policy is to develop a perspective. And one of the things that the greening has to do is to bring a green perspective to whatever it is that we are doing. So for example, in the case of agriculture, we have such a long history of land degradation, destruction of forests, destruction of, of, of um, fauna, of animal um, habitats, of, of concrete in, in, um, encroaching on arable land. We have such a history of that, that we must by now recognize that at some point, we have to take a more informed way of, of working with land. And it's, I mean, there, there are things that we need to incorporate in our way of life. For me, every child should plant a tree as part of going to school every semester of that child's life. It should, it should be part of going to school that you plant a tree. And obviously you try to coordinate it so the type of tree that is planted and where it is planted and so on and so on and so on. So I think that if, you, if you're going to take a, a, that kind of a view, which you call a circular view, which is quite natural in the environment, what is uh, the, the, the flower today dies and fertilizes the plant for tomorrow. So in agriculture, it's quite obvious that it is cyclical and, um, and it is circular, but you, are, you may also want to think of not only circular, but a spiral where the circle rises or falls according to how you how the processes develop, whether they get more robust and larger or smaller. So for agriculture, it is, it is clear. For public health, the challenge there is lifestyle changes. We have to figure out how to change people's behavior. The example I use to use with my students a lot is that when I grew up, I drank water coconut and ate mango, running up and down and around the place in the summer. And when I finish, I fling it in what I call the bush. And this thing called the bush, which was just a natural environment, would absorb it and it would dis disappear. The animals would eat it and it would fertilize the, the bush and keep going. But now I am using styrofoam packaging and plastic bottles 
So I can't have the same kind of behavior that I used to have as a little boy because the environment cannot handle the materials that are used now. And so it is a matter of the kind of public education of having people be more conscious of what they are doing in connection with the environment around. And you know, there's a lot about our folklore that shows a lot more respect towards the environment, the trees, the plants, the animals, than um, we have come to practice, maybe because we are disconnected in an urban environment. So there's a lot to be learned from people who live close to the environment, the kind of respect which they show. Uh, so for public health to me, I don't believe in the vaccine. Of course, vaccines help, but you need to live your life in a way that you don't need the vaccine. Live your life in a way in which your food is your medicine rather than your medicine becoming your food. So I, I think it is a perspective that is very important for people to adopt. That's the best I can do with a question like that. It's so far reaching and so rich. To Dr. Witter, Dr. Smith, you wanted to make any interventions on this question? Dr. Smith, you wanted to make any interventions on this question? Yeah, I, I agree with Mike. It's a very good and broad question. I would sort of throw it back in a sense to those who are working in government. And it seems to me very difficult for government as it is set up. And I'm not referring to the current set of ministries, but over history, We've always had a bunch of different ministries and we cut and carve and reshuffle cabinet. But it's always seemed to me very, very difficult for ministries to work with each other. And for, unless you have a special project, difficult for a more holistic or transdisciplinary approach to emanate from government work. So something is either it is, it's a ministry of health problem or it's a Ministry of Agriculture problem, unless it's a project, in which case sometimes in projects we manage to get people from different ministries to work together. We need to find ways of looking at problems in a much more holistic and transdisciplinary way. Otherwise, I think what we're going to do is we'll be chipping away at the margins of the problem and never getting anything done on a large enough basis to transform ourselves to a sustainable or green economy. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, um, uh, just to let you know, um, colleagues, that we are now at 1.30 and we had intended to finish at one o'clock. Um, so we are now into the lunch hour for many persons and I really don't want, uh, we're losing persons at the same time. So what I will ask, I know that John Neal um, has asked like, a question to Dr. Smith. So what I will do is just ask, um, um, our colleagues to look at the questions posed by, um, say, John Neal and even um, Alistair Scott in, in posing the question about systems. He made the point that uh, we need to start to connect um, the different um, sectors. So he says uh, agriculture is very connected to primary and preventative health care, but we don't seem to connect these at the policy level. And this seems to fit with greening our economy. So he's also talking about harmonization of policies, um, that thing about coordination of policies, et cetera. So these were issues related at the, even at the beginning with um, Denise Forrest talking about development and implementation of policies as being key to the success of transitioning towards a green economy. So we take those comments on board, um, but I don't really want us to go any further um, now. Um, and uh, because we are going to be losing a lot more persons. So I would really like to take the opportunity to thank very, very much all the panelists um, for your um, expert opinion and your expert recommendations on this very, very, very important issue. Um, please um, know that the, from the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change, we are, we are not taking the recommendations of either the panelists or the participants likely. Um, we are going to be sharing the outcomes of this uh, workshop with Dr. Witter to help to inform the green economy investment strategy that he is um, developing. And again, as the minister said in his um, presentation, it is our intention not to put this document on the shelf, but to also share it with those key regulatory agencies that are directly involved in investment um, 
investments in the country um, and responsible for it. And we will provide the necessary support from the environment perspective. And of course, climate change is also an area within our, our new ministry. So thanks again very much to the panelists, Dr. David Smith, uh, Mr. Mr. Barrett, um, Mr. Thompson, and Mr. Bernal, thank you very much for your participation. And again, a big thank you to Dr. Witter. Uh, he has also always written, written, risen to the challenge. And uh, we thank him very much for his uh, lending his support to helping us to develop this green economy investment strategy and also helping us to chart the way forward through this workshop. And thanks again to the participants for your, for your participation. It's been a very, very good session. And I think the ministry should try to do similar sessions where we get experts together to have discussions on some key um, issues. And we don't have to do it face to face. Obviously, we can do it um, virtually and get as many persons together as possible to lend our collective wisdom to issues that are before the country. So thank you very much. I also would like to thank Kashta Graham. She's a project manager for the Plastic Waste Minimization Project. And just to say to you that you have received already the draft document, the Green Economy Investment Strategy. It was sent to you when we sent out the, the letters of invitation. So we are still inviting comments on that document. And we ask that you send it to kashta.graham at NEPA. And kashta is K-A-S-H-T-A dot graham at nepa.gov.jm. Or to send it to minimize plastic, no S, minimize plastic, one word at nepa.gov.jm. And it would be very useful if you could give us by the end of the month, I know you will have Christmas dinner, so probably while Christmas dinner, you can probably have a notebook beside you um, and just jot down a few things to us. Or early, early in the January, um, when we, we, we plan to finish the exercise in February of, of next year. So Dr. Mita is working to have the final document uh, ready for us by February, February of next year. And so this is yet another opportunity for others to really weigh in and, and give their input on this important document for us. So thank you very much for taking the time and thank you all and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.